Our scripture this week comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 21, verses 1 to 19. The Gospel of John, chapter 21, verses 1 to 19. Listen to the word of God. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, which is also known as the Sea of Galilee. And he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Canaan in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and the two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, you have no fish, have you? They answered him, no. They said, he said to them, cast the net to the other side to the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because they were so many fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes and for he, he was naked and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came to the boat, dragging the full net of fish. For they were not far from the land, only about 100 yards off. And when they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went abroad and hauled the net ashore, full of large fish, 153 of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now, None of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared before the disciples after he was raised from the dead. And when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Then Simon said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, and feed my sheep, free my lamb. A second time, he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Simon said to Jesus, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. And Jesus said to Peter the third time, said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt to go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will fasten the belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. 
He said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. After this, he said to him, follow me. Friends, this is the word of the Lord for us this morning. Thanks be to God. Last week, our guest speaker, the Reverend Mark Koenig, shared with us about how Jesus appeared among the disciples just a few days after he was buried and risen from the tomb. But this was not the first time, and this is the third time that he had appeared, appeared before the disciples. But many of the disciples remained skeptical and confused. I probably would also if I were one of them. Like the Apostle Thomas, some still had doubts about Jesus' resurrection and needed to see it for themselves in order to believe it. Our passage this morning takes us to one of those post-resurrection encounters that Jesus had with his disciples. This took place back in the fishing village by the Sea of Galilee. Some of those disciples were wondering what they were going to do next, now that the spiritual leader was no longer with them. Should they continue to do what Jesus had commanded them to do? That is to proclaim God's message of hope and salvation and to bear witness to Christ's death and resurrection? Or should they just go back to where they were doing before while keeping themselves in low profile and off the radar? Unfortunately, some of them chose the latter. Could those disciples really go back to what it used to be? I highly doubt it, especially after what they had experienced with Jesus over the past few years. Too much had happened since they committed and invested their lives in order to follow Jesus. In order to do that, they would have to start from scratch, pretty much, to go back to where life was before. Their lives have been changed by the death and, the re and now the resurrection of Christ. They were now witness to all of these things. And their mission was to tell and share their eyewitness account with others especially among those who were not there, so that they too may believe without seeing. In verse 3, Simon Peter, who was the most outspoken leader among the disciples, told the group that, that, he, was told the group that he was going fishing. And the other disciples who were with him would follow him likewise. So they all went out and got into this boat and began fishing. Well, as it turned out that they had fished all night but caught nothing. You see, you have to understand that these were professional fishermen who had done this for years, if not for generations. Even though they might be a, a little bit rusty over the last couple of years, but they still know how to fish. They, you know, they knew what they were doing. So they knew what they were doing and, and, and they knew where to cast the net and when was the best time of a day to catch the fish. But yet they still caught nothing. This was significant because this signifies that these disciples were no longer the people they used to be. They have been transformed and renewed through their experience with the suffering and the death and the resurrection of Christ. It seemed as though they were offering a sign that, that, that there was no turning back when it comes to following Jesus. 
It is a lifelong journey, a lifetime commitment. They could only keep going forward, advancing the message of hope and salvation for those who have yet come to know Christ. How soon had these disciples already forgotten Jesus' message and Jesus' message of hope and the instruction for them to, instead of catching fish, they would now be catching people. Their calling is greater than their individual lives and their own personal needs. These disciples were called to be a part of God's greater mission for humanity. It was never about them individually, but it was all about God and God's mission for humanity. Perhaps like many of the early disciples, some of us might wrestle with our own sense of call and mission right now and with our own unknown future. The changes that Jesus called upon his disciples to make were more than a change of profession. It was a change of one's perspective towards life and attitude in relating to one another and ultimately with God. God will use us in any way God sees fit. Even those, those who may, even those who may have rejected and denied him in the past. Or just look at Peter, who felt so ashamed to be associated with Jesus as his disciples. Peter was the perfect example of how Jesus offered second chance to those who redeem, who need to redeem our failures and shortcomings. Failure to acknowledge our own personal faith in Christ that, I don't, that not only change our past, but lay the foundations of our future. What happened to Peter proved to us that transformation is possible, even to those whose hearts are hardened and remain stubborn. It can happen to us as well. In verses 15 and 17, interestingly, when Jesus asked Simon Peter, he's saying, do you love me? Jesus asked Simon Peter three times, just to make sure, do you love me? Now, as you know, there in, in Greek, there are three terms that are being translated into three terms that are being translated into English as the, for the word love. The first two times the gospel writer John used the term agape. Agape means unconditional, sacrificial kind of love. It demonstrates a total commitment and dedication towards someone. Jesus asked Peter, do you agape me? But each time, Peter responded back to Jesus saying, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Here, the gospel writer, John differentiated Peter's response from Jesus's question. They were not on the same page together. The term for love that Peter was referring to was filial, which means to love someone as a brother or a sister. So when people respond, when Peter responded to Jesus's initial questions, do you agape me? Peter responded back to Jesus saying, yes, Lord, I feel you as my brother or as my sister. Jesus was asking for and expecting the agape kind of love from us and unyielding and unconditional, unconditional love just as Christ had offered 
to all of humanity and to us today. Jesus was somehow annoyed by Peter's lackadaisical response and commitment. So he asked Peter for the third time, just to make sure that he understood Peter. But this time, when he said, do you love me? He used the term filio instead. Do you filio me? Do you love me simply only as your brother and nothing more? In other words, Jesus does not settle for quick and superficial response. He knows where our allegiance and where our hearts lie. Peter had to face this true feeling. Peter had to face his true feeling and motives when Jesus confronted him. The question is, how would we respond if Jesus asked us today? Do you truly love me? Are you even my brother or my friend? It is easier to say that you love someone, but it is harder for us to live it and to act it. Similar to those disciples who make the decisions to drop everything and follow Christ wholeheartedly, Jesus wanted us to live up to our own calling and our commitment to follow him, even when he is no longer with us physically, but he is still among us spiritually. Jesus challenged his disciples, as well as to us today, that it is not enough that we profess that we have faith, but we must put our faith into action. We must never underestimate God's power at work among those who place their trust in him. Peter knew that he was gifted and that he had been chosen to serve as the lead apostles among the 12. But Peter still had doubts in himself and his abilities. He must lay aside his personal pride and accomplishment and to allow God to work alongside with him, to be shepherd among God's sheep. He must not only talk the talk, but he must also walk the talk as well. In the same way, we must also feed the sheep, nurture them, protect them, and guide them to discern, guide them to discern God's calling within them. The only way we can do so is by th through God's love as exhibited through our lives. By the virtue of our baptisms, we have declared our total and unyielding commitment in Christ to be his disciples. No longer do we live our individual lives for ourselves, but we live our lives for Christ. Our Christian faith journey and discernment is a lifelong commitment and a constant work in progress. It doesn't matter how long we have been a member or how long we have been baptized. What matters most is how we demonstrate our faith obediently through our lives as led and empowered by the Holy Spirit. We live by Christ's command to love one another by feeding of our sheep and the tendering of our lamb. In a moment, we will once again come before the table of God's unconditional grace and love. We have been reminded to live by faith and not by sight, according to God's many physical grace and tangible signs of love. 
these earthly bread and wine and the cup reminded us of God's magnificent grace as poured out upon each one of us. They embolden our courage and our faith to demonstrate God's agape upon all of humanity. Through the breaking of the bread, the disciples' eyes were opened and they recognized who the resurrected Jesus was. Likewise, through the drinking of the cup, Christ has made his presence known to us, both physically and spiritually. We have come to recognize not only what Christ has done for us in the past, but we proclaim what Christ is actively doing and will continue to do for us in the future. Friends, Peter's story today encourages us to trust that Jesus continues to meet us right here at this table where he feeds us just as he fed his disciples. We are also empowered to do great things through God's nourishments of our souls as God continues to feed us. This is all part of God's doing and not ours as we come, eat, and follow. Through this spiritual feeding at the table, our eyes and our ears, and ultimately our hearts will be open so that we may experience Christ in a more intimate and personal way until Christ returns once again. Thanks be to God. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen.